It has been over two and a half months since Evermore Park was last open to the public. This may come as a surprise if you've only looked it up on Google, which says that the park is still open the same times as always. There have been some sad reviews on there of people who expected this to be accurate and then showed up at closed gates, which really sucks. If I didn't know better, I think you were still around. But if you visit the website right now, it is still only advertising the December 2023 season and offers no indication that any other dates will be made available in the future. Today is St. Patrick's Day. They usually have an event for the holiday and did not this year. They also usually have a special event for Easter, which is not currently planned. The social media accounts are similarly mum on the matter of Evermore's reopening. Given rumors of the park's permanent closure towards the end of 2023, some have been wondering, is this the end for Evermore? At least when the winter season closed, it certainly seemed like the intent was to open up again in 2024. There have been some rumors swirling this weekend that make me less confident that this will take place, which I'll talk about later in the video, but at least for right now this second, we are still in the potentially brief moment of history where this theme park exists. We are currently in the Evermore era. The only reason I thought that Evermore expected to open up again when there hadn't been any public statement one way or the other is because on Christmas weekend, I saw the new CEO walking around the park and walked up to ask some questions. His immediate response and forever his first words to me were, who are you? Which one is absolutely the correct reaction to a complete stranger coming up and asking to record video of you. And two is a humbling reminder of this channel standing in the Evermore Park community, which is probably also the correct reaction. In our conversation, the CEO, Ross, shared that an extended closure was the plan to rehab the park, but that it was not expected to be permanent. I'm actually looking forward to, like, I'm, you know, we'll close at the end of Aurora. Yeah. But it's to rehab the park. The buildings need some love. You know, mm. a lot of kind of heavier landscaping to get figured out. And the goal is, like, you'll see some pretty radical change come with us, and, um, and we're going to do it differently. Gotcha. You know, I'm not going to give too much away. And it'll be a similar time of year, like this summer coming up? We'll probably open May, um, and then we'll get really, Mythos will get into more full swing, kind of mid-summer. Ross says to expect a phased reopening starting in May and increasing later in the summer. So it sounded at that time like we should expect Evermore Park to return, but not for another few months. This is only somewhat more detailed than the park's only real indication on the matter, which is a paper sign on the gates stating that 2024 dates would be announced at all. When I caught Ken in the park under similar circumstances, he had the following to say. 2024 is going to be a good year for us. I, I'm actually quite excited about it. We brought on some new individuals to help. Um, so I actually took a position as chief creative officer now so I can focus more on the creative artistic side of the venture and the experiences. And we brought on a new CEO that's going to help us with the operational side of the business to improve that. If you haven't been following Evermore Park News very closely, then you might not be aware of how Ross came to be CEO at all. Back in the Halloween season, the employees were told that Evermore was going to go out of business and that Halloween would be the last night the park would be open. But I didn't stay dead. Four days before Halloween, Ken called Ross and asked him to invest in Evermore to help keep it afloat. Ross was given 30 minutes to make the decision and he decided to help. I got the call and said yes. That's why I'm here. Four days before things got really, really bad, I got a call and I'm like, okay. That's an awkward, you want an awkward conversation with your wife? That's it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I know I have a job and I have a business and I've got tongue going on, but what do you think about this? Yeah. Right? And I had 30 minutes to make the decision. Nah. The CEO of Ross said a lot of other things in our 15 minute conversation, which I will return to. But Evermore has a history of saying things that differ from the eventual reality. So first I wanted to focus on what actually happened in practice during Ross's only season in charge so far, as it may be a more valuable indicator of what Evermore could look like in the future. The most significant change under Ross's tenure is that entry to the park is now free of charge. My vision for the park is open doors. You can walk right into the town of Evermore without any ticket at the gate. On the other side, you'll find the decorations and ambiance, so you can just walk around and see what the little town looks like. And there's a vendor market where you can buy fantasy-themed goods from local businesses. The hope is that while you're on the property, you'll spend money on some of the paid offerings that can be found in the park, like food and beverage, or activities like ice skating or knife throwing. How do you think things are going with allowing people to come in for free? Really well. I don't know how else I could have expected him to answer this question, but it does line up with what was communicated internally. I heard from a lot of different people that in response to fears that this approach might not be financially viable, it was shared that Evermore broke even on the season in the second week. 
Now, I don't know by which metric they were claiming this. If they were only counting the labor of the actors, for example, there were 11 of them hired this season for a park that was open four hours a night across four weekends. It's a huge oversimplification, but that would be an investment of about $4,000 in labor for the entire season. If about 70 people a night purchased the Christmas Carol walkthrough over the first two weekends, then yeah, the final two weekends would be 100% in the green in terms of an actor investment. But were they taking into account bigger expenses like the rent that they now pay on the property? Maybe, but I don't want to tout this claim as much as others have been. In either case, Ross made it clear that the strategy here wasn't just the short-term gains. What wasn't being made in ticket sales was a hopeful investment in word-of-mouth advertisement. I know there's a lot of stress about, you know, about finances. You're like, what the? But it's a numbers game. This is not exclusively about this season. This is about next season. This is about, wow, that would have... Remember when we went to that place for Christmas? I went, they're open again for some spring. There's been no word of mouth. The amount of people that live in Pleasant Grove in Saratoga who have never been here and don't know what it is, is mind blowing. They're going to talk about it, which is, which is the point. We're just honestly trying to allow more people accessibility to the park. They can learn about it and attract more people this time of year. I asked Ross if the free word of mouth advertisement could actually end up being a negative thing if the guests have a bad experience. He said that hasn't been his experience. So there isn't a huge fear there that people are coming and having a bad experience and then no, they won't come back again? No, not particularly, by and large, the people I've spoken to, and I've spoken to dozens of people, you know, like midway through the park and as they've left and afterwards. <laughs> and it's, the number one thing is, wow, I had no idea that was awesome that I would come back. Like, honestly, it's been so fun to look at people that have never been in this place before. So, wander around and have a sense of wonder. The amount of people that walk into that tavern to do the Christmas adventure and are like, holy crap, this is incredible. They've never stepped foot in the park. Again, I don't know what else you would expect the CEO to say right there on the spot, but I went around asking some folks in the park how their night was going. I honestly expected a lot of negativity regarding the season because that's what I had been exposed to from the Evermore fan community. But when I was talking to actual people on the ground, I was unable to find any. Have you ever been to Evermore before? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. What's your experience like so far? Besides the fact that it's cold, it is kind of magical. It is cool. There's lots of lights, and I wish I'd worn my hat with the elf ears. Have you ever been to Evermore before? I have 2018 at Lord. Okay, and this is your first time back since the first season? This is my first time back since... 21. What's your experience been like? It's actually been nice. Loved it. Cool. Good times. I mean, it's snowing! Is that good or bad? It's good! Okay. It's yeah, beautiful it's out here. Bad. I'm it's with you. So I agree with you. I hate it. It's, <laughs> what am I doing here? It's so beautiful and we're it's all going to so freeze pretty. to death. Have you ever been to Evermore before? Yes. Like a lot or just like one other time? Like twice. How's your night been so far? Actually pretty great. What made you come back after being here the other time? I actually really enjoy it here. The uh, stories and the uh, activities. Have you done any of that so far tonight? The, the Christmas adventure. Christmas yeah, adventure. the Christmas adventure. Have you ever been to Evermore before? I have not. I have no idea what's happening. But it's cool, the ambiance is Ross believes that this lack of disappointment may specifically be due to the fact that entry is free. When the experience more closely matches what was paid for it, people are less likely to be disappointed. Ross explained why this free format is a better fit for the park in its current state. The issue has always been you charge a premium historically, you know, combo pass is forty-two dollars. We're halfway to a lagoon ticket. Yeah, yeah. Right? This is not lagoon. <laughs> so the expectation of cost and value is a finished park with more going on. That's where a lot of our disappointment has come from. Whereas now, you have zero expectation. Come in for free. If you show up here and you buy hot chocolate, you sit by a fire with your friends and family, and that's your memory, that is amazing. Right? That I'm not we are not here to turn you upside down for dollars, we're here to help you make some memories that you wouldn't be able to make otherwise. The three things that are highlighted as part of the free offering are the decorations and lights, the Christmas market, and a picture with Santa. The decorations and lights were generally the biggest draw for the casual guests during this time of year, and I've always been shocked at how such a small team gets them set up every year. But this year it was crazier as the team got even smaller. Before the winter season, the assistant director of show design and his sibling, who also worked on the show design team, left the company, depleting the majority of the team's manpower. 2023 saw a lot of significant employees leave for different reasons that might warrant its own video, but in the meantime, a small squad had a lot of stuff to do. 
he literally was talking about how the last two weeks he's been like, pulling all the airs. Oh, when it's trying to get all the Christmas lights up. Hi, Jarvis. Did you put up all these lights yourself? A lot of them. A lot of them? Okay. So I don't know who was supposed to be doing this big revamp, because aside from how few individuals are working at Evermore, it has long been the case that almost everyone involved with Evermore is not mainly working on Evermore. For most, it is a second or third side gig. Ken had a Kickstarter launch last week for a candle bulb that's more of a focus at the moment. We have engineered our flame bulb to include the latest in LED technology. So what made us want to create something this amazing? It all started with Ken. And I wanted to have a light bulb that could do different things. Couldn't find the product, so I sat down one night and started inventing it. And for Ross, I think this is barely in his top five ventures currently. Even outside of work, in his church last month, he was given the role of stake young men's president, which is a leadership role that will take a lot of energy and focus. They were supposed to meet months ago to plan out the coming year, but it kept getting postponed. The Christmas market was an opportunity for the vendors inside to sell their wares. The center of town was a little outdoor mall, and shopping was the main thing to do in the free version of the park. Some have suggested that upholding this opportunity for the vendors could have been a big motivation for them to have a winter season at all. Up until less than a week ago, the vendors had been told to expect a similar format in the summer, where people could come into the park for free and they could expect a lot of people coming through their shops. My original script joked, what is told to vendors is about as official as ever more communication gets. But if that is truly the case, then I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't mention some worrying rumors from the vendors this weekend. It all started on Thursday the 14th, when Ray popped into the Evermore fan discord saying that she noticed multiple Evermore vendors posting on social media selling their stalls that they have at Evermore. She was kind enough to send me these screenshots of what she saw. Their posts at the time indicated that there was about two weeks of time for people to buy these stands if they wanted. I reached out to some of those vendors on that day to ask why they were selling the stands, and they said that they were told to remove them. Apparently things escalated two days later on Saturday, and instead of having a couple of weeks to get their stuff, the vendors were told to come get their things immediately before they may no longer have the chance to do so. It was on this day that Derek Tucker commented all over the last several posts in the Facebook fan group the same phrase, Evermore under Ken's ownership went out of business this week. Some of the places where he posted it are still there, but the only one where he elaborated on what he meant has been deleted. Luckily, I am not a healthy person and screenshotted it before that happened. Derek elaborated that he had heard this rumor from a vendor friend and that Ken was currently packing everything he could into a shipping container. There is a shipping container on the Evermore property that had already been a topic of interest in the community. So you may be thinking, Bob, if any of this is true, aren't you kind of burying the lead in this video? But that's the key point, if this is true. The last time that I shared a rumor at this level of speculation in a video, it was saying that Meow Wolf had invested in Evermore and saved the park. And even though I had heard that from literally half a dozen distinct people, it turned out to be a complete lie. I have heard a lot of claims this weekend. Some have said that the bank has seized the assets, that the locks have been changed and everyone is being escorted in and out. But when I was on property this week, it didn't seem super locked down to me. The door was left wide open for folks to come as they please. I saw someone in the main building packing up what looked like costumes. The only change this weekend was that they put up cones to block the parking lot. All that we really know is that Evermore is cleaning stuff up. It is a fact that vendors were asked to come pick up their things. And it is also a fact that there's a shipping container on property and that Evermore is packing things up and cleaning stuff out. If you peek through the gates, you can see that a ton of stuff is boxed up in the town square, and the barrel trash cans have all been collected to the west gate. If you peek into Vander's Keep, the chairs are all stacked up, and there are boxes and shelves. I swear I'm not delusional. I know how bad all of that sounds, and I'm not saying that the rumors are absolutely not true. It's just that I've been burned by being wrong before, and I don't want to look like an idiot again. If it is true, we'll have an infinite amount of time for a post-mortem in a future video. Maybe these are just the radical changes referred to by Ross earlier. Or maybe the radical change is just that the park is dead. But you know who isn't dead? Santa! It was free to take a picture with Santa. The original plan was to have it behind a paywall, and some of the language on the website still indicates this intent. It would have been a pretty standard mall type offering to pay to come up to Santa and talk to him and take a picture, but instead they left it free to bring more people in. I'm surprised this wasn't a bigger deal because people freak out over free Santas. My town threw a public event this Christmas and we were waiting in line to see Santa for like an hour before my daughter got too cold and we just drove home. We barely made it halfway through the line during that time. 
So in a way, I'm glad that people didn't hear about it, because my daughter was able to go up to Santa, which she had been so excited to do, without having to wait in any line at all. What have you been doing? For me? It is ginormous. Am I ever seen one that big? Can I read it now? I was grateful for Mr. and Mrs. Claus too. I thought it was really meaningful that there were still actors in the park in some form that weren't behind a paywall. But Evermore was hoping to get more money somehow. There were the familiar food offerings such as the burger joint, the Keto Cafe, which might seem very familiar as they were still using the Halloween themed menu from last season. They also changed the Barter's East stall to sell tickets and act as an info booth instead of as a snack stand as it had previously. That's not all that changed about the building though. The restrooms in this building were shut down, and the water fountain was not operational. I don't know if they turned off water to this building because it wasn't a snack stand anymore, or if it wasn't a snack stand anymore because there wasn't water running to this building. But either way, it was a good idea to have a place to ask questions set up more prominently towards the park entrance, especially as they were hoping to attract more first-timers to the park. Right, so we have never been here, what do we do? Uh -huh. Setting up the booth is one thing, but they could have improved on having answers to questions. Almost every employee that I talked to expressed or demonstrated not knowing how things were supposed to work to some degree. You bought your Christmas Carol ticket online before you came here? Yes. And they had no way to like receive you or give you a ticket or anything? Yeah, I just asked at both the gates and they basically said like, oh, you're gonna do that over there. No, you're gonna do that over there. And I'm sure I'll find somewhere while well, I'm supposed to do that. This is not their fault and is a result of not being communicated to, but it has come to be the expectation. One question that a few did know the answer to is that season pass holders got an all access pass to the paid offerings at this booth which was a good move on Evermore's part to honor as best they could their existing agreement. There was a lot of concern about this leading up to the season, and I think that they did the right thing. The only type of ticket you could buy at the gate was a combo pass, which bundles a lot of those paid offerings together. On the website, the combo pass promises a Christmas Carol adventure, ice skating, a train ride, the wings of Evermore show, archery and knife throwing, a hot drink, and a snack treat. However, upon arriving, the combo pass card was different from expected. Hey, Ray. Question for you? Yeah. So I got the comic book pass, right? Yeah. I thought they said that it included things like ice skating and like... Is that not on there? We have an entree, a drink, a dessert. Hilarious. The train and the walk. It added some things that were not advertised on the website, such as giving away free food that they didn't have to. And it removed some things that were advertised. But one thing that stayed standard on all the lists, online or on the card, was the main offering of the combo pass, which was the Christmas Carol Adventure. I would like one Christmas Carol pass, please. This was the only way to experience any kind of story at Evermore this season. There were actors, and you could technically interact with them a little bit, but not much. Any objections? We're gonna be ghosts? Spirits. You know? Do we have to die? Right then, right this way. All right. Even in this walkthrough though, some guests weren't super clued into what was expected. Sometimes people would just walk past the actors without stopping to hear what they had to say. Who's gonna leave? Yes. Without saying hello. 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 Goodbye. Goodbye. Hello. Goodbye. 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 These days. But provided what the entertainment department was given and the framework that they had to stay within, I was, as always, amazed with how they rose to the challenge. The actors only had their first rehearsal less than a week before the opening night of Aurora, and they did a good job with their characters, taking what they were given and running with it. The walkthrough took place in the closed off outer ring of the park. There were pairs of actors at these five locations, the tavern, the mill, the graveyard, the inn, and the library. There was also a late addition of a solo character here at the statue. The actress for this role got a call about 10 minutes before that aforementioned rehearsal was about to start, and as she said, she practically fell into the car and zoomed over like her life depended on it, which I love. Right, but it's much too cold. Come in, everyone. Come in, please. Our Christmas Carol adventure begins in the Crooked Lantern Tavern, where we find Mr. and Mrs. Cratchit. My name is Mrs. Cratchit. This is Mr. In the book, Mr. Cratchit's first name is known, and it's the best given name that God has bestowed upon man, but I found it funny that his wife never has one written. We are told the names of most of their six children, but in 1843 we're not burdened with hers. In the Evermore version, this is where we learn that we will be training to become spirits of Christmas present ourselves. In the book, it is clarified that spirits of Christmas present only have a lifespan of 24 hours, but don't let that be a hang up for you. You are provided with a card that you can have stamped at each of the next three areas in the walkthrough to mark your progress. When the card is completely filled out, that is proof that your training is complete. 
The first such area is the Nettleton Mill, and on the bridge we run into the Ghost of Christmas Past. In the book, the Ghost of Christmas Past is described as follows. The figure itself fluctuated in its distinctness, being now a thing with one arm, now with one leg, now with twenty legs, now a pair of legs without a head, now a head without a body, of which dissolving parts no outline would be visible in the dense gloom wherein they melted away. So, since that would be difficult to achieve with practical effects, they merged this character with one of the individuals that Scrooge and the Spirit visited in their tour of the past. That of Belle, Scrooge's former love that they visited at the moment that they broke up due to Scrooge's change in priorities, and then again to see her happy with the husband and family that she had chosen instead of him, just to really twist the knife. The Spirit leads us next to Fezziwig. Although this walking tour will later include clairvoyant specters and mythical givers of gifts, the most fantastic and far-fetched concept is actually found here, in a capitalist that values life over profit. Wealth. It's not something you measure in gold, but the riches of life. Even the cartoonishly greedy Scrooge, before any ghostly visits, gives his employee the day off on Christmas with full pay. Does your boss do that? Cheers! Cheers! Those are the moments, my friends, that truly matter. Fezziwig will ask your group for a time in your past where you felt happy. Never more pre-COVID. <laughs> and upon answering, we'll distribute stamps and point you towards Loudon's rest. If you decide to walk through the catacombs on the way, you would see the ghost of Jacob Marley through a door and a skeleton with a top hat that speaks as Scrooge. I built my fortune with my own hands, and I won't be swayed by sentimental notions. At the top of the hill, we see the ghost of Christmas yet to come. As in the book, this is the scariest of the three spirits, but unlike the book, the spirit speaks. Scrooge's choices of greed and malice wove him a solitary end. How utterly predictable. <laughs> in A Christmas Carol, this spirit only points to things as a response to questions or otherwise. That would have been kind of boring and confusing for attendees, so I like what they did with the character. Shackles at their own neck! On the actual character sheet, the name Huntress is given to this spirit. But I don't know what that means, it went over my head. In any case, I like that the actress still incorporated the silent point at times. Like when she would encourage, as in the book, to look upon Scrooge's headstone. This headstone was one of the few in this field that wasn't imported from a graveyard in Europe. But leaning against a real one was the caretaker. This is probably actually based on another niche character from the original story. A character that stole a fine shirt that Scrooge was to be buried in off of his dead body and sold it along with bed curtains that she stole off of his bed hooks and all while he was laying right there dead. While an off-putting individual in the book, the Evermore version seemed to be a bit of a fan favorite. She would ask what your group's dreams were for the future and you would get your second stamp. You can consider this your one and only ticket out of the graveyard. Believe me, it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Next, you would encounter the solo character that I mentioned earlier called the Wisp. This character acts as a bit of a Jacob Marley stand-in presenting the option and challenge for a theoretical Scrooge to change his ways moving forward. Once you've decided, you can continue on in whichever direction you think is right. If you were to turn back and make the choice for Scrooge to remain miserly, then you would be greeted with a roped-off staircase. So, in lieu of any edgelord-esque shenanigans, we move downhill towards a changed man. Once we enter the final building of the walkthrough proper, the Pygmy Weed Inn, we meet the forgetful Terry, the inn's keeper. Terry lives in a world where Scrooge has become a changed man, and he has personally benefited from his generosity. He will show you his cool magic bowl. Can you give that little tap on the side and see if it's the magic one? Oh, yeah. And then direct you towards the man himself. In the main area of the building, Scrooge stands beside a table set for a feast, and then will ask the prospective spirits to name something that they are grateful for. In answering, you earn your third and final stamp, and your training is complete. Although the formal walkthrough is now over, Scrooge directs you to the spirit of Christmas present to present your card and become fully initiated. Thus, the walkthrough experience for most actually ended with a visit to Mr. and Mrs. Claus to touch his magical staff and feel the Christmas spirit. So, does the walkthrough accomplish its goal? The main takeaway of the Christmas Carol story is to spend your limited time on this earth in a spirit of generosity and gratitude, especially around Christmas time. All characters involved at least tried to instill these concepts in some fashion. It was a quick, light, abbreviated version of the story. The whole experience would take under half an hour, and the majority of that time would be spent walking with your group. You could, and probably would, get through this whole thing without uttering a word. Someone in your group would answer each of the three questions, but odds are it wouldn't be you. 
So this more scripted stage show-esque version of Evermore isn't the one that I've grown used to or uploaded videos of to this channel, but the rest of the combo pass contains activities with which you may be more familiar. As per the usual during a winter season, Evermore offered ice skating on that weird plastic ice. Ice in quotation marks? Do you see the grid? There's like lines. It's just a bunch of those placed really close together. Ice skate rentals were not available on opening night. I bounced around between a couple of different employees who weren't sure what was going on there. I don't know where I would get ice skates. If I wanted to ice skate, where do I get ice skates? I'm going to find out about that. Oh, okay. I'll come back and ask later. Thank you. Eventually, in later weeks, the ice skates were available. You grab them from this tent here, use them over there, and the experience was enjoyed by some. The train was generally not available. Most people thought that the train didn't run once for the entire season, but that's technically not true. See? Here's a video of the train running during the first hour of the Aurora season. But sadly, this recording was of its final journey. The snow that you can see reflected in its headlight caused them to stop running the train for the evening, which made sense because, as you can see, it was really coming down. But even weeks later, when the weather was perfectly fine, the train never resumed service. They even blocked it into the tunnel behind this wall of lights, which leads me to believe that they, for some reason, had to make the season-long decision to shut it down. Worse than the train, the Wings of Evermore show literally never took place. Can you buy tickets for, like, the Bird and Reptile show? <laughs> There isn't going to be a show either way. Okay, cool. Thank you. Before the season started, it was decided by new leadership to take things in a different direction. And Evermore Park now has no plans or intent to include live animal programs. The animals themselves were purchased and licensed by Master Ben and did not belong to Evermore Park. So when he and his team were let go, he helped the animals find a new home, except for his llama, which he still has. The only domesticated animal that you could still see in the park when I took this video on the final night was Brimstone. The glass house that used to be the home of the animal show was partially cleaned out to offer another building for guests to freely wander into. Ross's longer term plan for the location is to be able to use it for wedding rentals. In the cases of both the train and the animal show, Evermore Park had about a month of opportunity to stop advertising these non-existing offerings on their website. But it's mid-March now and they are still advertised online today. Instead, they left it up and posted paper signs telling guests to email for a refund. Several Google reviews and my own experiences show that if there are employees going through and processing refunds, that it's taking several months to do so. If it were me, I would have at least deleted references to the train and show from the website to alleviate disappointment. The angriest reviews on Google this season were from people who came to see advertised things that were not there. They had archery and knife throwing with some new additions. Did you say there's brand new axes and knives and stuff? Yes, yes. Nice, that's exciting. The axes are something that everyone's kind of wanted to have for a while. Yeah. The axes are very, like, natural to throw. They're fun. On top of this, they were in the process of improving the range by putting up some fresh wood, but they weren't yet able to complete this when I visited. Is that what this wood is for they're going to put up? It's the new ones, not the old ones that got taken off. quite have time to paint new ones just yet. You can also get a hot drink and head to the Copper Confection for a sweet treat. I did notice that by the end of the season, the park let their stock of candy almost entirely run out, perhaps deliberately. But even if they didn't have the candy you were looking for, this is where you could find the most interactive experience in the park, which is getting yelled at for flipping Tip Top Switch the wrong way. Oh, and you're gonna want to sit the lever. Lift the lever and then look behind the stairs. Okay. Look at that. So that's what happened in the winter season. But what will the upcoming season look like? Ken had a little bit to say about this. It's going to be an ongoing evolutionary experience. You know, we've learned things that have worked. We've learned things that haven't worked as well. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to evolve it into something that everybody can enjoy. You said that Evermore is always kind of evolving. There's always things building. What are some things right now that you're the most excited about changing? Um, you know, we just have a new year and every new year we get to kind of assess, you know, what has worked and what hasn't worked as well. And um, we get to be creative and start designing out our next season. When I said he had a little bit to say, I meant very little. No real details. But to be fair, I had never spoken to this man in my life before this moment. I just appeared like a little YouTube gremlin with a phone camera that was already recording and started asking questions. He had zero opportunity to actually think about it and handled that encounter better than I deserved. 
But Ross, thrust into the same situation, already had some ideas for the future on his mind before I got there. Uh, I want it to be open during the day in the summer. You know, right? if we can get things to a place where it, that, that makes sense. All things going well, we're going to open during the day in May. Probably from noon till probably nine o'clock at night. Okay, yeah, that'll be different. And again, just to let people come in, show up with your kids, kids are out of school, hang out with your family, trying to have some activities during the day. There'll be little pops of fantasy here and there. Um, we won't have any actors during the day, um, but we may have some performers show up and we'll have some concessions open. So Ross imagines Evermore's summer soft opening to be a lighter experience where they will have extended hours during the day where you could come hang out take in the ambiance, enjoy some food, but there will be no actors during that period. The actors are what makes Evermore Park special to me. So this is the part that stuck out to me the most and I asked more about it. Your ideal Evermore, or at least the vision you have in your mind, is less actors. No, it's, there, it's more immersive place? experiences. Actors are here, have historically been here to distract from the things that aren't finished. If I'm talking to you, I'm not seeing the unfinished pile of dirt. So it's more of a balance, you know, um, it's more of a, the ability to go and explore at your own leisure without forcing a story through, go talk to this character, this character. You shouldn't have to walk in and the first thing you're confronted with is actors. If you're not used to that experience, people run away. This was something that I experienced frequently firsthand. I worked at the park as an actor for a very brief eight weekend period from June 16th to August 5th of last year. My role was that of a town crier and my entire purpose was to be right at the front gate from the second that the park opened until the closing ceremony at the end of the night, trying to round up as many people as I could and try to help them understand what the heck was going on. Confusion about what there is to do other than wander around aimlessly is one of the biggest problems that the park has. I had an excitement and passion as well as a depth of knowledge about the park. I wanted to share that with other people and help them have some of the really positive experiences that I've had there. I went up and directly interacted with as many people as I could, and some of them hated it. And I'd be a hypocrite to blame them. At the event where I first fell in love with Evermore, Connor was at the front of the park serving the exact same purpose, trying to corral people around and tell them how to play Evermore. I saw the big group of people who had assembled and said, well, time to skedaddle and walked right around them straight into the most barren and unfinished part of the park. I didn't even know that you could talk to the characters and do quests until the event was mostly over. Once that happened, I had maybe the most fun night of my life, which kickstarted this obsession, but getting people from point A to point B there has not been an easy problem for Evermore to solve. And it has a very low success rate currently easing people into it and attempting to make Evermore more accessible to a wider audience is one of the main things on Ross's mind. To break down barriers and to let people realize like, hey, you grew up with a great imagination. You grew up like telling stories. At some point you let that behind and you don't have to. Like you can come in here and participate in the story. You can quest and do your own story. Or you can just come hang out with your family and just make your own memories. And I think that for me is, um, it creates a broader reach, it's more accessible because hey, it's a D&D &D place. Oh, it's, it's for LARPing. Oh, it's for cosplay. Oh, it's for, no, it's just a cool place. It's actually a European hamlet. That's the, po that's the problem. It's not what I want. Right, but this is bigger than you. Please come enjoy the park, have a blast. But don't turn your nose up to people who are here just with their kids. That's one of the most weird and interesting things about Evermore Park. Something about it wiggles its way into people like a little worm and just occupies a space in their mind. And what Evermore should be has been imagined in so many different ways by different people. I have a different concept of an ideal Evermore from the one that you have. And both of us are thinking something different from what Ken currently is. And even that is different from what Ken will be thinking six months from now. So many suggestions that I hear include taking this unique thing that Evermore has stumbled into and making it more like this other thing that already exists. I often disagree with that and feel that Evermore should lean into what makes it different. But what gives me the right to think that my personal version is the best one? I can see no reason to feel confident that your idea couldn't be better in practice. And Ross says that some of you have made those voices heard. There's definitely been some pushback. I've, we've had some unfriendly reviews. What were the unfriendly reviews like? What type of things do they bring up? Um, not enough fantasy, and it's really okay. hard for attendees. It's like, give me feedback. I'm, we, are, we welcome feedback if it's constructive. 
So continue to give them feedback. A small company like Evermore often won't be able to tell what is going well or going poorly unless you tell them very directly how your experience was. It seems like Mythos is going to have the same free entry approach that Aurora did, so there's no longer going to be that moment where you pay for the ticket, walk through the gates, and everything on the other side is unlocked as part of this full story experience. If entry is free, then any story will presumably be locked behind an additional paywall which for operational reasons may be confined to a specific area of the park, and from what we've seen historically, is likely to be a guided walkthrough. I do anticipate that the main Mythos season will at least have something like that, as Ken points out characters and story as the things that set Evermore apart. The key thing I think that separates us from some other places is that, you know, we have characters inside the environment and story, so you get to just go on an adventure and enjoy a story. So. Gotcha. Is this the first season where there haven't been actors in like the general area of the park? Um, yeah, it's because we've opened this up free to the public, yeah. this area. So um, we're putting all of our actors into the actual um, theatrical environment, right? Into the experience, the story experience. So. They've usually already held auditions for Mythos during this point in the year, so they're already behind, but I do anticipate that they will have some type of actors involved by this summer. What I hope they maintain is questing, something to actually do. Several theme parks have wonderful characters to interact with, but you go up, say hello, joke around a little bit, and then walk away. Very rarely do they give you some quest to go and complete. But Ross says that's something we should expect to continue as well. But it sounds like questing will still have a role, even if yeah. it looks different from we'll, how it is now. I mean, again, it's not Evermore without it. We were, at that very moment, in an Evermore without it. So what would future quests look like for him? I'm actually working on, um, with a local group on um, an augmented reality app for the park. Okay. That you can just go and explore without ever having to talk. So there's something for everyone. You want to go talk and interact, go do that. If you want to walk around and just kind of experience it at your own pace, you can also do that. The idea of having an app for Evermore is not a new one. It's one of the main things that newcomers seem to suggest. Evermore actually had one almost entirely finished for the first iteration of the park, but it just barely didn't make it into World Walker's hands. I had already heard about this goal for a new Evermore app in 2024 from other employees before Ross, so this is more than an off-the-cuff statement here. But I wouldn't actually expect an app anytime soon. The current financial state of the park, combined with the success that the parties involved have had with this in the past, makes it feel unlikely to me. Which, great news, is probably the best possible outcome. Nothing happens? Yeah. I could never put it better than the legendary Disney Imagineer Joe Rohde, who famously said, If I'm supposed to be living with fairies, fairies don't have iPhones or magic bands. Joe disagreed with the direction that the Disney parks were taking with this tech because he felt that it broke immersion. Joe Rohde actually visited Evermore Park back in its early days. He put up a long post about it on his Instagram, which will be linked in the description, but the post concludes with the following impression of Evermore. This is a people park. It compels you to engage with people. The infrastructure is nothing more than a framing device for interactions with actual live people made of flesh and bone who could open their mouth and say anything because they are actual people. He continues, Those of us who work with big technology, huge budgets, long production cycles, and famous brands can take a very simple lesson from this place. It's the people. Because all parks are people parks. At least they should be. I'd love to end on that note. But instead, I'll ruin it because I want to talk about the YouTube search bar. I mentioned in the Oktoberfest video that I didn't understand how likes help a video, but I've now had my first real experience with them and can share. Evermore walkthroughs are the most watched type of video on the channel. About a dozen people watch them every day, and 80% of those find it through YouTube search. There's obviously people seeking out recent videos of the park in this fashion, so I recorded a video for Aurora as I hope to do every season. I loitered at the Christmas Carol entrance for literal hours waiting for there to be a breaking guest so that I could sneak through without getting in anybody's way. I put up the video and it showed up in the search results for the first day and then it completely disappeared. Even if you specifically search for Evermore Park walkthrough, it shows the videos for the spring, summer, and fall, but it's like the winter one was completely wiped from existence. I was trying to figure out why it was being treated so differently by the search, and the only significant difference was likes. Normally those videos get about 30, but this one only got two, so YouTube blotted it out and made it literally impossible to find. I don't actually mind this specific case because I don't personally value those types of videos that much, but it was an interesting learning experience in the impact that likes can have, especially on a smaller channel. 
as even if somebody was specifically looking for that video, they would have been unable to find it. So keep that in mind as you go throughout the YouTube world. If you see a video that you think other people might want to see, you have the power to influence that to be possible. Anyway, I'm really tired, so I'm going to go to bed. See ya. Mm -hmm.